This forum is part of the City Club's Local Heroes series, sponsored by Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy. We're grateful for their generous support. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and also a proud member. Today is April 23rd. You're with a virtual City Club forum. Today we're live back at the City Club itself. Big thanks to our production partners at IdeaStream for helping us bring the forum back to the City Club today. Joe Marinucci is with us. He's no stranger to the City Club stage. He is present every year for our annual State of Downtown Forum, a tradition that began 10 years ago under his leadership. And he's a frequent audience member and a City Club member himself. But today he's here for the final time representing the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Next week, he retires from the Alliance after serving as president and CEO since its inception 16 years ago. Born in Italy, Mr. Marinucci and his family emigrated to the U.S. as a child. But if you ask him, he's always considered Cleveland home. His resume certainly reflects that. He spent the better part of four decades working to improve the downtown business district and neighborhoods. He led the Alliance's predecessor organization, the Downtown Cleveland Partnership, served as vice president of real estate development for the Playhouse Square Foundation, and was also a member of Mayor Mike White's cabinet, serving as economic development director in the early 1990s. During his time with the Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Mr. Marinucci has played a leadership role in many downtown milestones. The city center is now home to 20,000 residents as a newly designed public square, has witnessed the rebirth of the flats, served as host to the 2016 Republican National Convention, the NBA Finals, a World Series, and next week an NFL draft. He helped bring $7.3 billion of investment to downtown and formed the Downtown Recovery Response Fund that helps small businesses deal with the effects of last year's civil unrest and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Today, Joe Marinucci joins us for a look back at his career and at the inflection points that have shaped downtown. And we'll also talk about what's next for the city, especially when the pandemic ends. I'm being optimistic here. If you have questions for Joe Marinucci or comments or a memory you want to share, perhaps, text your questions or your comments to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet it at the City Club. If you're on Twitter, we'll, we will do our best to work them all in. Joe Marinucci. Welcome back to the City Club, Joe. Thank you, Dan. It is so good to see you. It's great to see you. It's great to be here in person. In um, person. We are both vaccinated. Yes. We're, we're here. We're not hugging, though. We're <laughs> not masked up entirely. We were before. Um, and I know it's weird that there's no audience here, but if there was an audience, Joe, I assure you it would have been a sold-out house. Well, well, thank you. And, and, and one again, thanks for inviting me to join you. Um, it is kind of odd being here, although I, I love the fact that, that we're live and, and mm -hmm. we're talking, and, and again, we're mas maskless. Mm -hmm. um, I do miss the audience. Uh, it, it, it Obviously, that's one of the, the, the great uh, attributes of the City Club is people getting together, networking, mm -hmm. and obviously conversing on, yeah. on some of the issues that we yeah. face as a community. You think you miss so. the audience. Joe. Yeah, yeah, I'm Seriously. sure you do as well. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, but Joe, I want to I want to start kind of at the beginning or at a beginning mm -hmm. when you began with Mayor Mike White's administration uh, running economic development um, back in 1990, um, 31 yes, years so. ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Paint us a picture of downtown in 1990. Well, if you think back uh, to, to that period, I, um, um, uh, I was actually living in Columbus at the time. Um, I was working for Dick Celeste, who was the governor of the state of Ohio, doing uh, business development and community development work uh, for the state. And when I started a dialogue with Mike White about coming back into downtown, if you think about it, we had the, the old municipal stadium uh, mm -hmm. and the issues surrounding um, some of the uh, uh, challenges of, of the Indians at the time in that facility and, and keeping them here in the city. The Cavaliers were out at Richfield. Um, they, were, they, were, you know, they were very, very happy out, out there and, and very successful. Um, we didn't have some of the investment that, that occurred uh, in the early part of the 1990s. Key Tower, uh, Fifth Third Center, all of Key those Key Tower types had of, been built. Yeah. Key Tower had not been 
been built yet. And there's still, uh, it was under construction when I, when I joined the team. Uh -huh. And there was still a lot of dialogue about the old Ameritrust Tower, if you, if you think mm -hmm. back to that time. So, so there was a lot of things that, that we now take for granted uh, yeah. as a community. Um, uh, we had an antiquated public square at that time. Uh, uh -huh. and, and you mentioned in the opening, obviously, the investments that we've made. But, but again, a much, much different uh, community. And by the way, very few residents in downtown Cleveland. And, yes, hardly and, any. And hardly any at the time. So, so the reality was it was a much quieter downtown. Uh, yes, we did have a significant job base, but the amenity package that we've created, I think, over the last 31 years as, as a community, um, the energy that's been generated by uh, a lot of the investment that's occurred, including the housing, uh, has really transformed downtown in many, many ways. Prior to the construction of the Gateway Project, which you alluded to with the you know, sort of unresolved questions around yeah, Municipal yeah. Stadium, mm -hmm. And the, and the Cavs being in Richfield, that whole area to the south of like the center of downtown was just a sea of empty surface parking yeah, lots. Yeah, if you think about it, it was, this, it was the central market site. There was one building in the center of, of, of a sea of parking. Uh, the site had been assembled, if you recall, earlier uh, in, in the decade of the 80s. And they were all kind of project, the Dome Stadium Corporation and other uh, efforts. And uh, it, yeah, obviously, one of the things that, that not only the civic leadership at the time, but the political leadership came together and said, you know, we really have to create a comprehensive strategy of not only building a, a new facility for the Indians, but also enticing the Cavaliers back into the core. And that mm -hmm. became part of what ultimately became a, a, a two-facility strategy. One, obviously, building the ballpark for the Indians, and the other, uh, creating a, um, uh, an opportunity to bring the Cavaliers back. And by the way, all of the activities surrounding an arena, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the entertainment and all the other types of things that, that animate uh, arenas across the country, we were able to bring back into downtown. Jacobs Field, then called Jacobs Field, now progressive. I've got to be careful, yes. I know, I just, just, is it, we're having a historic conversation, yes, so yeah. we can talk about Jacobs Field and Gund Arena. Um, those were, I mean, that's such a, such a long time ago to think about, mm -hmm. yet the, the politics and, the, and around major, particularly sports sure. projects, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. um, those haven't changed a whole lot, right? It's still a very uh, fraught endeavor in this, in this public, pri what, what sort of euphemistically referred to as a public-private partnership, what others call, refer to as public subsidy. Right, right. Um, those challenges haven't haven't really changed at all, and you know they, these they continue to be these important assets that have to be invested in by both the public and uh, sports ownership. When you look back at those deals, um, do you have and and think about and thinking about the way in which our community talks about public investment in privately in sort of privately owned uh, facilities like that, or they're publicly owned? I'm, I'm struggling with the language here yeah. because <laughs> because it's so confusing. Mm. But when you think about those deals that you were instrumental in putting together and how they've played out over the years, do you, do you ever wish that, like, that you'd had more leverage or been able to do things any, any differently? Well, I, I think by any discernible measure. The, the, and again, those were tough discussions, as, as you remember. Tough yeah. discussions because, as I said, uh, creating a ballpark uh, a modern ballpark for the Indians. Um, again, convincing the Cavaliers to come back downtown. Uh, uh, all of that was part of the, the public-private dialogue at the time. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, the referendum was actually razor thin. Although mm -hmm. if you ask people now whether they voted for, for the syntax that, that, that created Gateway, I think there you know, was massive difference of, of, of perceptions that mm -hmm. it passed by a wide margin. But the reality, it wasn't. It was, as you say, the acrimonious debate. Uh, and in, in essence, it was, it, was, it was very hotly contested. But think about downtown that we now have. And think about how those assets, the infrastructure that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. have built upon uh, and created opportunities for us over the years. Uh, you know, we're one of the few downtowns in, across America where someone can live and work mm -hmm. in, in the downtown and walk to see the Browns, walk to see the Indians, walk to see the Cavaliers. Those are assets that bring young professionals yeah. uh, in, in, into downtown. When we contemplated the economic uh, um, uh, leverage that the, the Gateway Complex would, would have created, I'll be honest, we didn't quite think through how it might impact long-term housing development in downtown. And that's mm -hmm. been one of the, I think, the surprises from my perspective that, boy, we, we did in fact do that. We did- In 1990, or nine, you know, while you were in the mayor's office, 90 to 94, did you imagine that downtown would become a residential neighborhood the way it has? Because I, I feel like 
feel like in the in the late part of the 20th century, downtowns were really you know whether it's Cleveland or Los Angeles, downtowns were the places for uh, for office work and commercial re real estate. You're, you're absolutely right. That was the the, the primary focus, and to mm -hmm. a, a limited extent, retail. And as mm -hmm. you know, downtown Cleveland had lost its, its retail base uh, yeah. uh, uh, significantly. But to your point. We, I don't think we fully understood the dynamic in terms of the ability to attract housing. We knew we had to make those infrastructure investments to keep those assets. Uh, we didn't know that those would translate into things like um, uh, if we didn't have a state-of-the-art arena, we would not have gotten the RNC. Mm -hmm. uh, we would not be uh, hosting the NBA All-Star Game next year and the economic consequences of that. We didn't. We, I, I think we understood that we would attract a lot of restaurateurs, which, mm -hmm. which we did. And, and ultimately, the whole adaptive reuse strategy that became the underpinning of our uh, of our um, opportunity to um, uh, bring housing in, into, di in, into the thing, we would make some good strategic decisions. For example, yeah. we said, we're not gonna allow a whole bunch of, uh, of our historic building structure to be torn down because we made the gateway investments. Uh, we were able, again, to take that historic fabric, reinvest in it, and uh, obviously the, we see the fruits of those, uh, the, those decisions now. You know, if you're just joining us, uh, you're with the City Club Friday Forum. We're talking with Joe Marinucci. He is, um, He's retiring next week. It's hard to believe that Joe Marinucci is retiring next week. He runs the Downtown Cleveland Alliance and has for 16 years since its inception. And if you have a question for Joe Marinucci, you can text it to 330-541-5794 or tweet it at the City Club, and we will work it into the program. Joe, you mentioned historic tax credits. Mm -hmm. And state and federal historic tax credits have been, um, I mean, it's this weird sort of wonky kind of policy piece that, 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 that was created, legislation created at, at different levels. Um, without it, without historic tax credits, downtown would be a very different place. It would. It would. It would very, very much, uh, be a much different place. And if you think back historically, Dan, one of the things we were able to do, you know, as, uh, as an alliance, as a community, mm -hmm. with our collaboration with, with other partners, is we'd recognize the, the historic fabric that we had. Mm -hmm. We built upon uh, the fact that we had these federal uh, uh, tax uh, incentives. And if you think about uh, what, what does historic uh, preservation mean, it, it means, one, investing in that historic uh, uh, infrastructure. But secondly, it creates additional equity to allow some of these older buildings to, to be created. And then we worked real hard to get the state to create a, a companion uh, historic pr uh, preservation grant program that would mm -hmm. match the federal program. And right about the point we were coming out of the recession was the point that all of this began to, to galvanize in terms mm -hmm. of uh, creating an opportunity for developers to take advantage of both the federal programs, the state programs, obviously contributions from, from the local governments as well uh, through ad additional support. And lo and behold, we were able to really accelerate the pace of those adaptive reuse strategies. It's really something to think about. I, I moved here in 2005, um, which, you know, you think about like 2005 through 2008, 9, 10, mm -hmm. right? It was kind of a, you know, a valley, right. uh, mm -hmm. especially for downtown. And I remember um, I, rem I was working at, uh, at IdeaStream, mm -hmm. which was a, a big deal project, right? To, a big mm -hmm. deal asset for Playhouse Square to create the Idea Center. And I want to talk to you about the Playhouse Square Foundation in a second. But, but when I think about I used to walk down Euclid all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes over here to the city club for an event, sometimes down to Public Square, um, and it was just empty. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could walk out of, out of any building on public uh, on, at Playhouse Square and walk across the street and not even look in either direction mm -hmm. because you weren't going to be. There were no cars. There was no traffic. There was no no bodies. And then they and then the Greater Cleveland Film Commission. Um, brought Spider-Man, brought that Spider-Man movie. I remember that. <laughs> that was an exciting time. <laughs> it, was, it was really exciting. It was so funny, you know, because because um, I walked out, of, uh, it, they were shooting a, a chase scene on Euclid, mm -hmm. um, and I remember walking out of the Idea Center and, and looking around, there were all of these people. There was just, it was packed with people. They mm -hmm. were all dressed in, like, they seemed like every one of them was wearing black, um, but I, it was sort of like extra, you know, mm -hmm. all the extras. And I remember thinking, oh, right, this is what it feels like to live in a city that mm -hmm. has density, mm -hmm. that has population density. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have to imagine that there were moments in those years where you were, because there were so many empty storefronts, so many empty buildings, entirely empty buildings, between, particularly between East 9th and, um, mm -hmm. and Playhouse Square. I mean, you, and none of it is stuff you could do on your own. Yeah, right. It was all, all based were, on collaboration. You, yeah. You mm -hmm. were a facilitator. Mm -hmm. You were a middle, like you were just trying to put these deals together and trying to find developers who had the capacity and the vision. Mm -hmm. 
And you must have, I mean, there must have been some depressing moments there where you thought, like, I'm never going to be well, able to I, do it. I, I would say, Dan, there were challenging moments. Yeah, okay, challenging moments <laughs> but, there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, your memories of, of, of Euclid in, in many ways are illustrative of the type of downtown I think we're in the process of creating. Because you're right. Yeah. Think of Euclid Avenue. Uh, we had a lot of disinvestment uh, up and down Euclid. We, we mm -hmm. had the loss of the department stores. Mm -hmm. A lot of the commercial base, the office uh, base, essentially moved slightly north and, and towards the square with some mm -hmm. of the new investment that occurred uh, in the 90s with Key Tower, Fifth Third, you know, so some of those investments. And in essence, we, we, what we knew was that, having said that, we did have this, this beautiful architecture up and down the street. So again, we created the Euclid Avenue Historic uh, tax district, mm -hmm. uh, a federally designated district that was kind of step one. Mm -hmm. We built upon then the use of those credits that we talked about a moment ago to, to entice developer interest. We had a bump in the road in the recession. Uh, in fact, at, at one point, uh, the 668 building, which well, got I love in. That you referred to the recession as just a, bump a bump in, in the road. road. I, it, was yeah, a, it was a big bump. Time, it was existential. <laughs> it was. It, it really, really was. But if you yeah. think about it, 668 uh, with the K&D group, they got yeah. their financing in right at the edge of the recession. They uh -huh. were able to get that project up and operational. You overlay the Euclid Corridor Transportation Project, and suddenly yeah. we had a rebuilt street. We had yeah. a transportation connection between Public Square and, uh, and University Circle. Yeah. And suddenly the momentum began to build to a yeah. point now where if you look at Euclid Avenue, we have over 4,000 people that live on Euclid Avenue from the park building on uh, uh, Public Square to the edge uh, at 18th and Euclid. We have Where the five, Lumen has just gone up. Right, uh, right, mm -hmm. right one block uh, east of the Lumen. Mm -hmm. And we have essentially five historic hotels on Euclid. So think about that transformation and the energy that's been created as a result of those investments. That's a, like, it is phenomenal to think about. And, um, but of course, like, it, you know, there's, it's not exactly like one step forward and two steps back. It's more like three or four steps forward and a couple of steps back. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the 925 building, the, um, which is this sort of centerpiece, the Centennial, yes. the Centennial Project that the Millennia Companies is working mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. um, you know, looks like it's going to come together, and that's very exciting. Um, but there's still just, you know, there's still these sort of empty, you know, like teeth missing in the smile. But you're actually absolutely right, and, and, and that's one of our challenges downtown. It is the, the missing teeth in, the, in that fabric, that, yeah. that, that, that experience, if you think about it. That's one of the reasons the Sheridan Williams project is so important, because it's going up on those surface parking lots that you mentioned a few surface minutes ago. Lots. And if you think about it, it will create that connective tissue, if you will, mm -hmm. from Playhouse Square through Euclid. And by the way, the fact that now you can walk down Euclid and you'll see the Euclid Grand is kind of completed, mm -hmm. that physical restoration of the space we still right. have challenges on a retail basis but you can yeah. walk down now all the way to the square and in essence see investment up and down the entire street which is mm -hmm. which is exactly what we want to see you know you, you look back at these three plus decades um, there's so much that you've done and we ha you know we haven't even talked about North Coast Harbor mm. and and obviously when I say you've done you've been involved in, right? Not yes. that nobody, <laughs> nobody did any of this by themselves um, but North Coast Harbor we mentioned public square we haven't even talked about sort of the death and rebirth of the flats or the what I refer to as the strange life cycle of the terminal tower. Mm. Um, but, you know, but there must be some things that are out there, Joe, that are sort of like your white whale, like the things you were you always wanted to do but were never able to do. You know, for me, if I'd been mm. in your position, it would have been like the removal of uh, coin-operated parking meters. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, we um, may get there soon, but well, that's another story. Yeah. Okay. Well, from your lips to the mayor's ears. But the, um, but you know, what what was your white whale? What was the thing that you that you always wished you could have you could have accomplished? Well, Dan, I, I think really um, you mentioned the lakefront, and, yeah. and in some ways, um, uh, I, I think of the lakefront as as that opportunity that uh, again the community is now reengaging in. But for a long time, if you think about it, we made the investment uh, under the Voinovich years in, in terms of creating North Coast Harbor, creating mm -hmm. that, that that harbor. Um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame came, the Science Museum came, the investment right. in First Energy Stadium occurred, mm -hmm. and. Subsequent to that, although we've done a lot to animate some elements of, of North Coast Harbor, the reality is we have not seen the type of leverage uh, yeah. that, that we fully envisioned. And, and in some ways, 
that I, I feel that that's my, for lack of a better word, we put my, 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 my white whale. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish we could have accelerated. I wish we could have had more uh, opportunities to create, maybe create that land bridge that now is, is being very actively talked about once again, uh -huh. which is great. But, yeah. but again, we didn't really see the investments. If you think about all of the public private partnerships that were created in that harbor mm -hmm. and the vision of the harbor, Mm -hmm. um, we didn't quite get there. Uh, although, yeah. again, I think the, the underpinnings are there. And by the way, one of the neat uh, opportunities being created by the NFL draft mm -hmm. and the NFL draft experience down there, and if you've been down there, is mm -hmm. those old warehouses yeah. uh, on the docks have, are, are now uh, gone. And once the NFL uh, uh, has a great week next week, we now have more of a pristine site to market uh, from uh, an investment perspective. So I'm optimistic that it will be uh, re 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 regenerated. But for, for me, the lakefront is kind of one of those things that, yeah, I wish we could have uh, accelerated that during my tenure in, 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 uh, in this yeah. position. Well, there's a, I mean, there, there is renewed interest. And it's interesting that that's the, that, that you bring that up. There, it has been such, I remember, I don't know, maybe it was 10 or 12 years ago, um, there was a, a design competition around the, that Mike Kristoff and, mm -hmm. the, and, and the AIA, the mm -hmm. Ar mm -hmm. I'll for, I forget what, the Association mm -hmm. of International Architects or something like that, um, you know, put on to um, reimagine mm -hmm. what, how we could do, to, to reimagine that or, or address that challenge, a particular challenge of connectivity mm -hmm. between downtown and, and the harbor because we have the highway and, and the train, exactly. and the train exactly. tracks. And exactly. it is such an enormous challenge. Mm -hmm. I remember when, um, the group plan commission moved from, you know, was sort of moving from the work of public square to contemplating the bridge. Um, that, uh, you know, the the design. You once you started contemplating the design, I mean, the span is enormous. It's like a yeah. half mile or something, whatever. Yeah, it is. It's I, like, I it's think really actually to get over the railroad tracks was a, a, a had to be a, like a nine hundred foot span in addition yeah. to all the the, the additional yeah. work that. So you it's not a half to. mile. I, I, yeah. I exaggerate. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Fact check. Somebody please fact check uh, Malthrop. He's but, off the but, rails. But, but you're all, you're you're absolutely right. It, 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 as you know, um, at one point there, there was state dollars uh, uh, allocated to that project. There were county mm -hmm. dollars. There were city dollars. And unfortunately, that, that initial bridge concept did not come together. Mm -hmm. um, and the, but having said that, I think we now have a renewed opportunity uh, to, to, re, to re engage. And I think we might create, on a long term basis, a better solution yeah. than simply an iconic bridge. I, I think mm -hmm. what we can do is better connect it. So, again, you know, it, would we in the future uh, bring uh, events like the NFL draft? There's more of a seamless mm -hmm. uh, ability for uh, downtown to expand in, into the lakefront. And Again, if we do that and we don't get more investment at, at, you know, at the lakefront, then we, that would not be a success, a success either. We need right. to get more mixed-use development, especially north of uh, First Energy Stadium. Yeah, the, when there was a plan, just you know, within the last five years, mm -hmm. that kind of stalled, and I, I know mm -hmm. that um, Dick Pace's organization, Cumberland Development, was, was really leading the charge on that and, um, and had development rights there, but mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I mean, it's a very complicated project, a very complicated um, it, it is very complicated, and unfortunately, that that did not reach fruition. But mm -hmm. um, uh, again, hopefully, with with this new discussion uh, about some federal funding that, yeah. that hopefully we take advantage of, um, we might again resurrect uh, uh, not only the, the land bridge uh, strategy, but again, mm -hmm. uh, attract a, a developer of substance. Joe, as you've been doing this work over the years, and you served on the International Economic Development Council, mm -hmm. um, and uh, as, I think you were chair, right? Right, or the chair mm -hmm. of the chair of the council. That gave you an opportunity to to look at cities around the world and what they were doing and look at sort of similarly situated cities in particular, the, the, whether it's, you know, Pittsburgh or, you know, or an industrial city in, in Italy or Spain or mm -hmm. Germany. What are the cities that have really like stuck with you as models that you have, where you've taken lessons and, and tried to, tried to bring the learnings back here? Well, historically, um, Dan, we, we've always looked, uh, both in terms of my IEDC experience and mm -hmm. in terms of my downtown-related experience, um, Philadelphia, uh, mm -hmm. in many ways, um, was, was, our, uh, was our model. Center mm -hmm. City, Philadelphia, yeah. again, very, very uh, dynamic organization. Mm -hmm. They've done a great job. And by the way, one of their strategies was, how do we aggressively get more housing into Center yeah. City? And, and mm -hmm. they've been successful in doing that. And they saw... Uh, again, as, as they grew that population base, retail come back into, into Center City in a way that historically has, hadn't happened. So one, uh, uh, I, I think they've done a great job. Um, we've been very close and, and watched closely uh, some of the strategies in Denver. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Downtown Denver's done, done a, a Amazing really, job. really nice job. Um, and you mentioned some of our regional um, counterparts. We, mm -hmm. we work very closely and watch what's happening in Pittsburgh and Columbus mm -hmm. and in Indianapolis, um, both in terms of, uh, you know, kind of our, our competitive set here in the Midwest. So, um, but I would say in, in terms of kind of thinking through that, that, uh, that stretch goal, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. Philadelphia in many ways has been that for us. And I know in Cleveland, we always like to compare ourselves to, to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> either, either one is kind of, is it a little bit, I mean, and I'm not going to, I think absurd is not the wrong word, not the right word. Um, it's not the wrong word either. I mean, Philly and Chicago are both like huge metropolises. They're, 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 they're much bigger. But yeah. again, in terms of some of the policy decisions we saw, for example, in, in, uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, we, we, we modeled it. You know, for example, they used residential tax abatement um, as a strategy to uh, induce uh, additional investment in, in Center City. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing here, coupled that with our um, you know, historic preservation strategies, and, and that worked very, very well for us. Mm -hmm. Joe, the, I was in a conversation on Twitter earlier today talking about this event happening mm -hmm. and, um, and noting that you'd been involved in so many of these economic development projects that had been really pivotal to, um, to what our city has become. And um, and I was implying that you've been a part of economic growth. And somebody asked, "Has the economy really? Have we really been experienced economic growth?" Mm -hmm. And um, and I know it's sort of a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is the whole state. Part of it is Cleveland. But how do you see it? Well, I I, I see it as as um, you know, the part the part that downtown plays in that equation. Yeah. And from from our perspective, we know that. We can't have a successful region unless we have a successful downtown. Mm -hmm. it, it's part of of, of, of the ability uh, of the region to coalesce. If you think about it, again, where's the NFL draft going to broadcast from? It's going to broadcast from downtown Cleveland. Where did the Major League Baseball uh, uh, All-Star Game broadcast? Broadcast from downtown Cleveland. So in many ways, the ability to 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 create a vibrant downtown where we're, we're attracting investment. I know has repercussions uh, mm -hmm. to the rest and, and, and leverages the rest of the region. I would agree with you that that we haven't seen enough of that, mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of uh, the rest of the city of Cleveland. But we know that if we can continue to work collaboratively with our neighborhood-based partners, with the city and with the region, we can continue, I think, to build the economy that, that, that we, we would all like to see in terms of Northeast Ohio. I suppose there's sort of this other like alternate timeline in which like none of these projects that we talked about happened and like the city just went further into disrepair or, or something like, I mean, you just don't know, I guess. Well, well th think about, Dan, I, I, uh, I'll share this with you. We built Key Tower uh -huh. and you remember there was a lot of dialogue about the companion tower, the Ameritrust Tower at the time. Mm -hmm. And after a lot of public debate, um, that project actually um, uh, was approved by the community. Uh, the project was demolished. Um, but because of the recession that occurred at the end of the, the 1990s, excuse me, 80s and beginning of 1990s, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole thing collapsed. So that's uh, actually not something I'm familiar with because I only got here in 2005. So what do you, so explain, because there's going to be people who are like, wait, what are we talking about? Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is that project didn't go forward. Where was that supposed to be? That was on the, uh, the Warehouse District parking lots. That okay. Now the uh, Sherwood Williams project is going to go on. <laughs> right. So if you think about it, uh, there's an example of something that did not happen. Um, yeah. and, and again, Key Tower, again, a lot of people argued about whether we should provide tax abatement to, to, to the Jacobs, um, uh, uh, Dick Jacobs when he built the tower and his brother David, but the reality is that's been on the tax duplicate now for 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and paying uh, its appropriate share of, of, of support uh, for the community. Mm -hmm. Correspondingly, the, the, the adjacent site, which had a 60-story tower uh, that was going to house uh, uh, the Ameritrust Bank and uh -huh. a Hyatt Hotel, never got built. Mm -hmm. And here, it's taken us all this time to figure out a strategy where we convinced Sherwin Williams that that was the appropriate location for their headquarter facility. It's a real challenge, though, looking to the future as Sherwin Williams vacates the, its current property mm -hmm. it, to move into that. What's going to? I mean, it's sort of there's a there's a fear that it's just sort of deck chairs being moved around. And well, well, but, well one, we solidify their 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 headquarter facility in Cleveland for yes, a no, long, and, long time, and that's a big win, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. So when we keep those jobs, they're adding jobs at the headquarters facility, and uh -huh. those are assets, the, uh, the the buildings that they're vacating, that we know as a community, we know how to reuse. 
Right. So if you think about it, those become assets that we can continue to reinvest, uh, maybe with another developer, maybe with Sherwood and Williams, but the reality is... You think the future is probably oh, residential I, I, for them? Either residential or mixed use, but the answer is yes. And, and the great views of the, great, of the river. Great views of the river and, and that whole uh, uh, the river valley, if you yeah. think about it. And the reality is that, that th those buildings, by the way, the, mm -hmm. the reason some of those buildings work so well for housing, but not necessarily for a modern commercial use, are two things. One is they were built uh, with enough window capacity to have fresh air, mm -hmm. because there, there were no air conditioning units. And second right. was, that was before the uh, invention of fluorescent lighting. Uh -huh. So they needed the light uh, right. and the air movement. And that's another way of saying the building is essentially a, a, a U or an E uh -huh. with a lot of nooks and crannies that will create yeah. great housing opportunities. Sure, much like the building we're in right now, exactly. which is not being, uh, you know, not to being turned into housing right now, but, but would be similarly, like, similar. Uh, so we're talking with Joe Marinucci today. He is the president and CEO of the Downtown Cleveland Alliance, an organization that he helped to found 16 years ago, came out of the Downtown Cleveland Partnership and all sorts of other things that were going on at the time. Joe's retiring next week, so this is kind of an exit interview, and we're getting to the portion of the program that involves your exit interview questions for him. If you have a question for Joe, uh, please text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. If you're on Twitter, tweet it at the City Club. We'll work him into the program. Um, Joe, any here's a first question from our audience, and you you got to imagine that it's like, um, you know, Imagine, who would you like to imagine is asking this question, raising their <laughs> yeah, hand, yeah. <laughs> having a mic in their face. We'll, we'll, we'll say that maybe this one's from Bruce a Mayor Bruce Akers, Akers, who called me earlier to say he, was wa he really wanted to watch. Were there any downtown architectural losses that occurred during your tenure that you regret or wish that they were still around, wish that you'd handled the deal differently? Or um, well, th there were probably some controversial losses. Uh, mm -hmm. The Columbia Building, for example, on, on, on Prospect that, that was demolished for... Uh, uh, what ultimately became the uh, casino's North Garage investments. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, those were tough decisions. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I fully appreciate, uh, and as you know, a lot of historic uh, preservationists wanted to save that building, and, mm -hmm. and I understood that. Um, mm -hmm. But at, at that point, we had to make a decision in terms of creating the, the parking capacity that was needed for the casino and, and recognize that the casino also was helping to ensure the long-term uh, reinvestment in an asset in, in the Higby building. Yeah. Um, and so those types of things are, are, are difficult. Um, mm -hmm. They're also, I, I think we underestimate the fact that, uh, uh, and again, uh, I wasn't necessarily involved with uh, you know, some of the early discussions with Playhouse Square, but if you think about the fact we were able to save those theaters as a community mm -hmm. and they were reinvested in in the last 30 years to make them even more viable, um, mm -hmm. that uh, is really a, a tremendous uh, accomplishment as a community. And if you think about it, the site right next to the City Club was the site of the Hippodrome Theater. Yes. Which was not saved. Um, right. And, and obviously we lost that in terms of the historic fabric of, 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 of the community. And by the way, it was a 6,000 uh, seat venue, very similar to the Fox Theater in downtown Detroit. Yes. So we lost, in, in essence, an opportunity to have mid-level shows uh, mm -hmm. in a theater like uh, entertainment uh, uh, venue. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that was lost and, and, and that predated me, to be honest with you, but, but sure. still very very uh, in, important loss for the community. It's amazing when you think about what what you, what you was able to be saved mm -hmm. um, through the Playhouse Square Foundation. Um, I'm sure there's questions about oh, that yeah, coming yeah. up, but um, here's another one. I'd like to hear about efforts to get and keep black-owned businesses and women-owned businesses in downtown historically and in the future. Well, one of the things, uh, obviously, um, um, that, that we uh, learned in, in some of the events that occurred last year, Dan, Dan is, is the fact that we have to be more involved in, in social equity issues. We have to be more involved in um, uh, racial equity and inclusion related strategies. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective going forward, one of the things that, that we are going to concentrate on is exactly that. There are very few uh, black owned businesses in downtown. There are mm -hmm. very few black owned restaurants in downtown. Um, we've learned that, that there are opportunities, and, and again, some of the retail spaces that, that have now been fully renovated present some great opportunities. So from our perspective, we're going to galvanize uh, uh, outreach mm -hmm. uh, and see if we can attract those, those entrepreneurs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, black entrepreneurs, both in, in the traditional retail sector, the office sector, uh, as well as the culinary sector, and, and really see if we can make a, a significant impact in terms of the diversity of the business space in downtown Cleveland. 
Um, could you talk about your views on Biden's infrastructure bill? This is a very this is a very city club sort of question. Kind of <laughs> yeah. random, random, uh, somebody who's, who's very very curious, but about and how how but specifically how you feel it could affect Cleveland's future, the upsides and any downsides. Well, it, it's interesting that he noted that because we've actually just put together um, a, a list of priorities for downtown. That, oh, uh, good. That we're, uh, we're given that we're, we're, we're about we're, to receive five hundred and eighty million right, dollars right, or something yeah. like and that. And don't forget the county also is going to receive about two hundred fifty million, give or take. So I the, know it's a huge dollars. amount of money. But if you think about it, let's go back to the lakefront discussion. Mm -hmm. If some of those dollars mm -hmm. uh, can end up being part of that land bridge strategy, mm -hmm. and we can put significant number, whatever the number might be, 25 million, 50 million, suddenly you can jumpstart that, that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the flats, flats are a great opportunity. One of the challenges in the flats, for example, is on the peninsulas, all of them have bulkhead related uh, uh, issues yeah. that are very expensive to deal with, if you think yes. about that. If we can get some federal dollars to help us fix those bulkheads and relieve mm -hmm. the private uh, investor from that, 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 that obligation, uh, which mm -hmm. right now they have, mm -hmm. that again is going to entice additional investment in the flats. So there are great opportunities for us to, to kind of galvanize that and use those dollars proactively uh, to help really, uh, uh, again, move, move the needle. Um, our green... So are those, are the, those are the those priorities are, uh, those that DCA couple, has those, identified? Those are a couple of them. Uh, uh -huh. and, and remember, too, that, that we can accelerate um, some of the green space investment. That, 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 that I think we, we can accelerate, whether it's, mm. um, uh, you know, uh, things uh, uh, to uh, kind of complete um, the, the valley investments that the metro parks are, 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 mm -hmm. are involved with, uh, the mm -hmm. towpath, um, yeah. uh, doing Canal the Basin. Canal Basin Park, all of those types of things I think can potentially benefit from this type of investment. So, uh, yeah, I think we have a unique opportunity as a community to take advantage of those. And, and by the way, remember, um, we have a, a hometown person in, in Marsha Fudge who now is the Secretary of Housing and urban development, very yes. influential, and that represents another opportunity for us to uh, maybe bring some assets uh, in, in, into Cleveland. Not as random a question as I had uh, as I had thought. No, thank no, you. No, 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 thank <laughs> you for that. And I apologize for characterizing it that way. Um, who do you see as you're retiring? Who do you see as the next generation of leaders? Are there specific leaders that you that you're excited to see them like take charge? And what initiatives do you expect them to champion, or do you hope they'll champion? Well, obviously, I, um, I think we're at an inflection point from that perspective, as mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. uh, I'm stepping down. Uh, a number of other uh, people uh, in, in other civic organizations, um, you know, Joe Roman mm -hmm. um, stepped down. There's been some transition uh, over, uh, obviously, with Tanya taking over for, uh, for Joel Ratner. Mm -hmm. So, Cleveland again, neighborhood progress, Cleveland, yes. Cleveland neighborhood progress. So mm -hmm. we're at a point where we, we are seeing some transition. And, yeah. and again, I, I think that's good. I, I think we, you know those of us that have been around for 30 plus years have had an opportunity, I think, to work on some of the initiatives that we've already talked about. But I think again, if you think about the young professionals, the Generation Xers, who mm -hmm. I think are, represent the, the next leadership wave, mm -hmm. really do have unique opportunities. Um, and you couple that with a potential, uh, obviously, mayoral uh, uh, change th th this fall, you have a lot of things coming together where where, where there's potentially being new civic leadership and mm -hmm. new public leadership uh, to kind of help us uh, guide, uh, guide us through the, the next phase of investment for the communities in general and obviously in, in particular for downtown. Um, I won't ask you uh, which mayoral candidate you think should be the next mayor, but if, you, you. if you choose to <laughs> answer that question or if you have a point of view on it, we're are certainly open to hearing it. But I'm curious what you think ought to be um, the specific uh, agenda items or what should be on the what should they be? What should these candidates and these campaigns be focused on? Well, I, I think um, you know, uh, again, putting putting the entire community uh, and looking at it, Dan, from that perspective, things like um, um, internet accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those types of issues are very, very important for the entire community, and and obviously downtown is probably better connected than, than other parts of Cleveland, but mm -hmm. we know the impact it's had on, on the rest of Cleveland, especially the east side. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about the, uh, again, uh, racial equity and inclusion related issues. Mm -hmm. We know we have to be, we have to do much, much better in terms of creating um, opportunities and, pre and, and working uh, to ensure that the safety net, in fact, uh, provides the type of benefits that, that, that we see. We know downtown, for example, we, we need to reflect the community. We, we need to be a more diverse uh, location. We need more housing, for example, that's mm -hmm. accessible to uh, a wider range of individuals in, in terms of the, the community. So we, we, I think that those keys are how do we make investment work and make it accountable for some of the goals that, that we're trying to achieve 
And I think that's going to be the, uh, the big discussion in the Muriel campaign this, uh, this summer when uh, I think as the, as you know, the field, I think it's set on June 16th, to be exact. To be exact. <laughs> that's, that's when we know. Yeah. Um, a, another question from our, uh, from our audience. A lot of people were excited to see phase one of the casino, but phase two never came to fruition. This causes increased skepticism when it comes to public support given to deep-pocketed private interests who make public promises but don't deliver. Should the public continue to be skeptical of large-scale capital projects that are over-promised and under-delivered, such as the Medical Mart or the Phase Two of the casino? Well, I, 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 think, I think, let's differentiate a couple things. Because, sure. because I, I think what's important here is, is and we talked about it a, a few minutes ago, the, the important investment we made as a community, maybe to the last part of that question, in the convention center, we had, by all discernible uh, definitions, a terrible historic convention center. And if we hadn't done what we did in, in terms of making the, the investments in the, in the convention center, and by the way, the global center was, to be, to be honest, the, the icing on the cake. The cake was the most important thing, creating a modern convention center that allowed us to get back into the convention world. Mm -hmm. it, allowed, it allowed us to, to re-enter that market. It allowed us to build the, the Hilton Hotel. If we don't build the Hilton Hotel, we don't get the RNC. So we've got to think in terms of how do these assets, how do these things create infrastructure that, that we can build upon. And yes, we, we can go back and we can say, well, uh, the investment of the casinos was a failure because they didn't build phase two. I look at it differently. The casino investments have become a, an important part of our visitor, visitor destination strategy. Why? Because people who visit Cleveland uh, want that entertainment option. You may disagree with it, but they want that entertainment option. And that, I, I think, is the, the, the strength of, of that investment. And we have to think in those terms. Mm -hmm. because, because one of the economic models we've created for this community, and again, evidenced by the NFL draft, is that's one of the underpinnings. We need now to feed the opportunity to bring more conventions in, into the city and to bring more major events, which bring us the, the uh, not only the notoriety, but the direct economic input that we've created for ourselves. So I look at it a little differently. That Yes, uh, I would have loved to have phase two, two built, but the reality is the, you know, the, the, the casino group still owns that land. There's still an opportunity to convince them to create some additional investments. And by the way, if you look at the vision of the valley uh, that, that the, the city is working on in terms of a creative um, um, a master plan for the flats, that's going to be a critical location in terms of mixed use development going forward. So I guess just to, just to ask you though, I mean, how do you think the public should engage with these ideas, though? That's the question, right? Like, should they be skeptical? Um, there are so many times when promises are made. Uh, you, you and I talked about the original studies mm -hmm. regarding Gateway, that it would create you know, 23,000 jobs. 26. 26,000, <laughs> thank you. Um, I was the author of that study. You were the author of that study, so you know. And it, it probably didn't do that exactly, but... Um, and, you know, so how should the, I mean, from my point of view, right, as a, as a former journalist and as, you know, like, I feel like the public should be as skeptical as the public wants to be, right? And, mm -hmm. and like, and people, people in leadership roles should be held accountable for, you know. And I, I, I don't disagree with that, Dan. I, I, I think the, it is good to be skeptical, but it's also, it's important to understand, again, we, we have overused in some ways the, the term public-private partnership over yes. the years. But it, it is important for us to know that, that, again, we do need to work collaboratively to entice private investment. And a public role in that is, is very, very important in terms of that process. And again, think through, as, as I said, the infrastructure we're creating that generates additional economic activity. Everybody loves the fact, for example, we're a foodie town. We, we celebrate it. You don't do Gateway, we're not a foodie town. Mm -hmm. And we need to think in terms of longer term opportunities that, that, that are generated um, and are a result of some of the investments. But I, I welcome you know, the open dialogue about whether this is a good investment or a bad investment. That, mm -hmm. That's part of what, what, what all of us in the community want to see. Because if you don't have that active discussion, you're not going to get, uh, I think, the type of constructive results that you're looking for. In, here's another question for you. In 2014, James Corner of uh, Field, Operation, Field Operations, mm -hmm. Field Operations Architects, Landscape Architects, came to the City Club to discuss the redesigned public square. The renderings they showed, uh, in, the, in the renderings, uh, there were buses using Superior, but it also showed bollards at either end of the square. Um, it wasn't built with bollards, and today, instead, we have these Jersey barriers. 
um, that the, our audience member says are ugly and could be easily circumvented by a determined driver with ill intent. How can Public Square be fixed? And more importantly, how can we prevent another situation like the Jersey barriers on Public Square from happening again? Well, I, I think um, um, the, the uh, questioner obviously knows, knows the square very well, and I appreciate yes. that. Yes. Well, if you think about it, uh, again, what, what happened after the original design was put in place and mm -hmm. we were preparing, if you remember, to, uh, to, to have the host of the RNC, mm -hmm. and the decision was, was made to keep the square closed during that period. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, remember, Closed Clara, to traffic. Closed to open traffic. Open to pedestrians. Open to pedestrians. It was, it was and, built and for humans. Remember. Uh, but also remember that what happened was Paris. Mm -hmm. where a big truck essentially uh, 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 navigated yes. into, into a major plaza. A, a lot of unfortunate deaths occurred as a result mm -hmm. of it. So the, the, the protective issues then, then that unfortunately weren't addressed in the original design, like how do we create maybe hydraulic systems yeah. that, that could in fact uh, 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 be put in place, um, that got waylaid unfortunately because we, we jumped into the Jersey barrier uh, scenario. But if you think about it, those types of hydraulic bollards, in fact, they have them at, at the Gateway um, uh, Complex, if, if, you, if you know their underground capacity, the Browns mm -hmm. have them in, in their facilities. Mm -hmm. Very doable, very, very uh, appropriate for this uh, climate, by the way. That's the type of investment that I think the Group Plant Commission is looking towards the future as, as one of the strategies to remove those Jersey barriers, create, again, these hydraulic bollards that can protect uh, the square when we have major events, uh, and still allow buses to, the, to, to be part of the fabric when, when, when we're not moving uh, in that direction. So You and I were a part of all of the conversations, many of the yeah, conversations many, from many. the very beginning, from the, when field operations was first engaged mm -hmm. and, and came with multiple ideas that mm -hmm. they presented to the public. Um, you remember some of the bridges and everything. The bridges, <laughs> there was a giant mound and yeah, tunnels, yeah. and it was, it was really exciting. But um, I've always been a little dismayed by the fact that it, the square has never been allowed to function as it was intended, as it was designed. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was never a moment where, where the, the powers that, that, that decide such things said, let's just give it a few months of, of letting it function as designed and see if it works. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, uh, again, the, 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 the powers that be made a decision that, that they wanted the, the Jersey barriers and they weren't at that point ready to consider the, uh, to your point, we spent a lot of time arguing and, and thinking through and designing what we thought would be a, a system, one that would embrace public transportation as part of that strategy. As you know, mm -hmm. that's very, very important. The, the reality is we have a train station right there, and, and the reality is the square is always going to be a connective point uh, to that train station. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. We, the, the, you know, the, that that was backburnered, and essentially the the Jersey barriers became part of the short-term stopgap measure. And mm -hmm. here we are now, what four or five years later, and mm -hmm. we still have the Jersey barriers. So, yeah, um, that's a that's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yes, um, but there's a there's a, a mayoral election this year and perhaps that'll be a challenge that will be met. If you're just joining us or just tuning in, we're talking with Joe Marinucci of the Downtown Cleveland Alliance today uh, at your City Club Friday Forum. Joe is retiring after 16 years at the DCA, an organization that he helped to found, and after more than three decades in public service um, to uh, Cleveland and the state of Ohio. If you have a question for Joe, 330-541-5794 is the number to text your question to. That's 330-541-5794. Or if you're on Twitter, please tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the program. Um, Joe, how do you think downtown will evolve post-pandemic, given that many workers will remain remote, people will be hesitant to participate in large gatherings, at least in the foreseeable future, even if they're permitted, and it might be harder to attract residents giving, given the rising rent costs and the perceived lack of amenities and vibrancy? in this current moment, and aren't you glad that's somebody else's headache? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, Dan, one, I, I think, let's start with the office market. I think mm -hmm. the jury's still out um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, really the long-term uh, impact to, to the office market. Mm -hmm. Will there be an Im impact? I think there will be. Um, will there be more strategies where employees can, can in fact work from home on an incremental basis? I think that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, will. Uh, companies, or for example, in Cleveland, take the position that no, we don't need a, a you know headquarter facility, and we're going to uh, work uh, remotely. I'm not sure that that's really the case. Now, having said that, even if 10% of the, the the workforce essentially works from home on any given day, that means 
if you think about it, we had 105,000 uh, uh, people commuting into downtown Cleveland every day before the pandemic. That's 10,000 people. So does that have an impact? Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but again, how big an impact, I think, is, is yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. On the housing side, well, I it means It means you know, fewer people fewer driving. Fewer people driving. Fewer people driving um, um, but again, what, do you, what, what, what happens in terms of the rest of the system? Yeah. Um, and and that, that's, no, a, that's a little mm -hmm. bit unclear. Um, I feel a, a lot worse right now if, we, if this was 10 years ago and we don't have the housing base that we have now. Right. We've shown that the, the base is strong. Mm -hmm. We know the vibrancy that housing creates. There's still plenty of, of, uh, of, of uh, developers that are very interested in, in, in making investments. You know, the City Club Apartments right next door to, to, to mm -hmm. you here, we anticipate they'll begin construction shortly. The Centennial, Centennial Project uh, is good. I mean, Caddy the, Corner. Speaking uh, of, the, the, of prices, I mean, the Centennial Project is over 800, 800 affordable, affordable, affordable units. units. Right. Now, again, to that point, we, we know we have to diversify. We know we have to make um, uh, more product available at a, at mm -hmm. a better price. Um, that's going to allow people uh, working in downtown across a broad spectrum to make a decision that they want to live here. If they do that, uh, obviously, there's less reliance on cars. Mm -hmm. um, there's more reliance on, on maybe other types of accessibility, mobility strategies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, how do we harness scooters in the future, which look mm -hmm. like they're going to be with us for a long time, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and make them work. How do we reinvest in some of the green spaces? Uh, and again, remember, green space is important not only in the core, and, mm -hmm. and by the way, there's very little land in the core, but how do we connect to, uh, again, the Centennial Trail? How do we connect to the towpath? How do we connect to Whiskey Island? Mm -hmm. Those are the types of things that I think we can, in fact, invest in, and I think that will allow people to continue to make decisions. The good news is millennials, uh, as well as Generation Zers, <laughs> if I could say that, continue to, s to show that they want to live in dense urban environments, mm -hmm. even with the pandemic. So mm -hmm. that remains kind of the underpinning, and I, I think, again, we have opportunities. Does, does that mean uh, we, we can't be very, very uh, intentional in, in terms of our strategies? Unquestionably, we have to be. But, but I think we can, in fact, come back and, you know, some national uh, 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 people like Richard Florida have said, you know what, we, we, the cities uh, survived the 1918 pandemic and, and we're going we're gonna to survive these as well. Well, cities have kind of endured, endured through exactly. human history. Exactly. Um, people like other people, as mm -hmm. it turns out. Another question for you, walkability has significantly improved over the years in downtown Cleveland. How can future city planners respond to the desires of private developers who want skywalks, for example, when they may run counter to the two advocates' opinions who want to see more people on sidewalks, not fewer? Well, I, uh, I look back at uh, a couple of things because I think the implication in, in the question is that skywalks are bad and, and having people on streets are good. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, I, I agree with that. But mm -hmm. there are opportunities where, again, a skywalk may make some sense. Mm -hmm. But the more important thing is how do we animate the public experience or, yeah. or, or that sidewalk experience? And that means we have to have Make good, the sidewalk more compelling. More compelling. We, for, mm -hmm. for, again, from an investment perspective, like we've done on Euclid Avenue, we, we've mm -hmm. got to invest in additional sidewalk uh, uh, infrastructure that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How do we make the walking down the street that by attracting retail into the empty storefronts. Nothing makes people mm -hmm. feel better than to see retail as they walk down the street. Those types of things, are, are, again, are going to make, make, make you feel safer mm -hmm. and make you feel more comfortable in terms of that walking experience. So it's a combination of those things that I think are, are going to be very important for us going forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, another question, um, what's next for Tower City? Um, well, well, Tower City is, is uh, uh, obviously a, a very interesting challenge. Uh, and as you know, the, the Bedrock uh, team uh, out of Detroit uh, controls that asset. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think they are now looking at what type of opportunities exist for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the avenue and for Tower City. And as you mm -hmm. remember, we talk about Tower City as kind of this monolithic thing. But the, mm -hmm. the reality is, as you know, the K&D group brought, brought a major investment in, in, in brought residents there. Um, the Renaissance Hotel is in the process of, of doing a full uh, renovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the avenue really is, I think, one of the things that people think about. But mm -hmm. I, I know Bedrock... And there's also the Ritz. Right behind there, right, and like right, right, connected, right. And, everything. And by I mean, the way, the Higley building, yeah. obviously uh, fully animated. 
uh, and Rocket Mortgage, obviously bringing 700 more employees to that complex. So, and by the way, another conversation about about moving the train, uh, the Amtrak. I, I, back I, I over noted there. that. Yeah, uh, I noted that. So the the bottom line is, is Bedrock um, uh, indicates to us that they are really looking to re-engage. Uh, as mm -hmm. you know, a couple of years ago there was a, a, a proposal by Bernie Marino, some of his team, in terms of the City Block project. Senate I think, candidate Bernie Marino. Is that the one you're talking? <laughs> <laughs> um, what I can share with you is is that. I think concept is still being talked about, but mm -hmm. more importantly, I think now uh, Bedrock has created a team, and, and as you know, they, they, they brought a new uh, uh, Cleveland experienced uh, developer to their table, uh, Kofi Bonner, mm -hmm. uh, who used to be with the Browns years ago, who knows oh, yeah. Cleveland. He's mm -hmm. now the CEO of Bedrock uh, Real Estate. I did not know that. Yeah, and he, uh, he I think, is regalvanizing the discussion about the avenue. So I think mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, talk about opportunities in, in, in the future, that's one of the opportunities, I think, for downtown that uh, I hopefully with... Uh, uh, private developers, we can rethink and, and reimagine that. Well, Joe, um, we're about out of time, and um, I know you're probably like, thank God, I just want to get through this next week and then put my feet up for a while. But I just want to take a moment and say, um, you know, on behalf of uh, uh, really myself, but other people who have come to love downtown Cleveland, thank you for all the work that you have done for the city. Um, we have only barely touched on it. It's like the top of the iceberg. And um, you have been involved quietly in so much of what we now think of as the major assets, the building and construction of the major assets in our built environment downtown. And, um, and I know that many times it has felt like a thankless task. So I want to say thank you for your work, for your service. And, um, and for joining us here today. Well, thank you. I, I've, I've greatly enjoyed uh, my work here in Cleveland and obviously my work in downtown. And by the way, I'm going to greatly enjoy my last week because the <laughs> NFL draft is going to be here next week and we're going to throw a big party. And yeah. I, I think people are going to enjoy it. We're going to have people from not only Northeast Ohio but across the country enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, that last week of, uh, of being the president and CEO of Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Joe Marinucci is retiring at the end of next week from the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Joe, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, little exit interview. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. It's been great having you with us. And I want to thank you as well for joining us for our Friday Forum with Joe Marinucci, as I said, the outgoing president of the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Our forum today is the Margaret W. Wong Endowed Forum on Foreign-Born Individuals of Distinction. Joe is one such individual of distinction. Uh, months before her birth, Ms. Wong's Chinese parents fled political repression and civil war caused by the communist takeover in China. She's an important leader in our community, and we're grateful for her partnership. We have three important conversations of consequence coming up next week. Please be sure to check them out on our website at cityclub.org. We'll be talking about mental health, about lead safe housing. And on Friday, we're back here at the City Club talking with Peter Kirsenow, a partner at Benish, Friedlander, Coplin, and Aronoff about, and also a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. That's our Law Day Forum next week. You can find out more at cityclub.org. I'm Dan Malthrop. Stay strong and stay healthy, my friends. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.